The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this lecture on nonlinear finite element analysis of solids and structures. In this lecture, I would like to continue to consider the plate with a hole that we already considered in the previous lecture, but I now like to turn our attention to a nonlinear solution. As we mentioned in previous lectures, a nonlinear analysis should only be performed only once a linear solution has been obtained. The linear solution checks the finite element model and yields valuable insight into what nonlinearities are important. And once again, we considered the linear solution of this plate in the previous lecture. We now want to go on with a nonlinear solution. Here we have the plate of the hole once again. Uh, it's a square plate subjected to the loading shown. Here is the hole. These were the material data that we used in the linear analysis. The thickness of the plate is given here. We consider only one quarter of the plate because of symmetry conditions we can, with that one quarter, considering that one quarter, analyze the whole plate, as we have discussed in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we also showed how we use Arduino in to generate the data for this mesh. And this input data, then, is used in Arduino to actually perform the analysis. We did the analysis for linear conditions in the previous lecture. Some important considerations for the nonlinear analysis are now what material model to select, what displacement strain assumptions to make, what sequence of load application to choose, and what nonlinear equation solution strategy and convergence criteria to select. We will address these issues in this lecture. We use once again the ADENA system, now, of course, for the elastoplastic static response. We will also investigate the effect on the response when a shaft is placed into the plate hole. Some important observations uh, regarding the nonlinear analysis are given on this view graph. First of all, we notice that the recommendations that we discussed in the, regarding the linear analysis that we discussed in the previous lecture are also very valid here, of course. But for the nonlinear analysis, we need also to consider and be careful with the sequence and incremental magnitudes of load application and the choice of convergence tolerances. We will address, of course, these issues just now. The first analysis that I'd like to discuss with you is a limit load calculation of the plate. Here we show the plate, and the load, P, will increase continuously up to a maximum value and then decrease to zero. The plate is modeled as an elastoplastic material, and the material assumption is summarized on this view graph here. Here are the material properties. We assume, basically, it is a steel. Notice the stress-strain law is shown here. We assume isotropic hardening in the analysis. We discussed what this means in an earlier lecture. Uh, the initial Young's model is the one that we used for the linear analysis. Nu is equal to 0.3. And the strain hardening modulus is given here. This idealization is probably only applicable to small strain conditions, strains that are smaller than 2%, roughly, the maximum that you would want to allow is probably 4%. Uh, and we will actually perform the analysis first using a materially nonlinear only formulation. This means, as we discussed in the earlier lectures, that we neglect all kinematic nonlinearities, that we only include the material nonlinearities in the analysis, these material nonlinearities. Uh, later on, we, however, want to also perform in this lecture, an analysis that includes 
the large displacement, large rotations, and in fact, even large strain conditions. And we will study those analysis results in comparison to the material in nonlinear only analysis results. The load history used for the analysis is shown on this view graph. You can see that we are increasing linearly the load up to a maximum value of 650 MPa, megapascal, and then suddenly decrease the load to zero. Uh, notice we are using altogether 14 steps, 13 to increase the load, and just one step to decrease the load. Of course, we are having here a time axis, but the load step or time step that we used was delta t equal to 1. Well, we performed this analysis a few weeks ago in my laboratory at MIT, and we brought in a video crew to video record our actions. Uh, I'd like to now share with you what we have recorded and also narrate to you uh, what actually has, is happening in the computer run as we prepare the computer run, as we run it, and also interpret the results. Uh, our first step is to modify the input data that we prepared in the previous lecture for the linear analysis of the plate. We now have to, of course, modifi modify this input data, uh, first of all, to introduce the load curve, this load history curve that we just discussed. And then we also have to modify the material data uh, to correspond to the elastoplastic material data that we now want to associate with the plate. So let us look now. Uh, at the video record of what we did some weeks ago in my laboratory at MIT regarding the change of these input data. Here we see once more the mesh that we are using to analyze the plate. And now we prepare input data for Adina in. Here we input the time function that we employ. You recognize the function points for times 0, 13, and 14 with the values 0, 6.5, 0. We also input that 14 steps are used in the analysis. The time step delta t is 1. Next, we input the material definition. And note that there is a typographical error. We typed plastic instead of plastic. We tried to do the typing fast and did not notice the error. Note the Young's modulus E, Poisson ratio nu, the strain hardening modulus ET, and the yield stress sigma yield are defined. Because of the typographical error, the program prints out an error message, namely the plastic material is not found in the library. Here we see the library of material models available in Adena. The library consists of the material models elastic, orthotropic, thermoelastic, and so on, so on. We now retype the material data definition. We also do not want to use equilibrium iterations. The default in Adena is to use equilibrium iterations. Actually, the BFGS method we discussed earlier, because large errors of solution can accumulate when iterations are not used. We discussed all this earlier. Let's see what happens when we do not iterate in the solution of this problem, just as a point of study. We now finally, by the command Adena, generate the Adena data input. Note that in this input preparation, we only change the data from the linear analysis data used in the previous lecture to the data for the nonlinear analysis we want to perform now. Having set up the proper input data for Adena in, and uh, having used Adena in to generate the input data for Adena, we can now execute that input data with Adena and obtain our first analysis results. We evaluate these analysis results by plotting the force applied here as a function of the displacements corresponding to this motion as well. And we will see that 
the force displacement curve looks rather unphysical. In other words, the results don't make much physical sense. So we search for an explanation. Why is that so? And we will find that the reason is that we did not use equilibrium iterations in the analysis. In fact, if you go back, you will see that we deliberately uh, did not want to use equilibrium iterations in this first analysis. Also, in ADENA, the default is to use equilibrium iterations. But I wanted to once show you what kind of results you must expect if you don't use equilibrium iterations. So we realize that we should really use equilibrium iterations and that we will, of course, have to change our input uh, a little bit through ADENA in in order to perform equilibrium iterations. The load history that we will still be using is the same. Here it is shown once again. But now we will use the default method of equilibrium iterations, the BFGS method. We, and this one will be applied. This method of equilibrium iteration will be used for each load step. Once again, 13 load steps up and one load step down. The convergence criteria that we are using in the analysis are shown here a convergence criteria on energy. And we talked about this one quite extensively in a previous lecture, and a convergence criteria on the force. Again, I'd like to refer you to our previous lecture. When we apply equilibrium iterations in each step, we will see that our results look good. They make physical sense. In fact, they look uh, quite appealing. So let us look now at these solution results. Let us go, in other words, to what has happened in the laboratory, the way we have been video recording it earlier. Here we see the solution results, the load applied as a function of the displacement, the extension of the quarter plate. On the horizontal axis we measure the displacement. On the vertical axis we measure the value of the load, actually the pressure applied. So far, the curve looks OK, but we show here only the response for the first 13 steps for which the load has increased monotonically. Here we see now the load displacement response for all 14 steps. Notice that the scale on the horizontal axis measuring displacement is different from what we used before. Note that the 13 first steps bring us to the maximum load and maximum positive displacement and that the predicted unloading response in step 14 is quite unrealistic. We obtain a large negative displacement. As we will see, this is due to not having used equilibrium iterations. Next, we look at the mesh and study the plastic zones as they develop with increasing load. A time code is given above the mesh. This time code gives the step number it increases until time is equal to 14. The plastic zones are shown by shading the area that is plastic. For the first steps, there is no plasticity. Then the plastic zone is small. It develops around the hole. and it grows rapidly as the larger load levels are reached. Note also how the plastic zone spreads through the elements. We use 3 by 3 Gauss numerical integration and test whether an integration point has gone plastic. If so, we shade the contributory area of the integration point. As an average, for each integration point, the contributory area is 1 ninth of the element area. Here at step 12, you can very nicely see how the plastic zones have progressed through the elements. The elastic plastic interface boundary goes through the elements. Note that at step 14, after unloading, much of the plate is still plastic. This is quite unphysical. We now rerun the analysis with equilibrium iterations, and here is the load displacement response we now obtain. 
First we look at the scales on the axis. We know that the loading response is similar to what we had before. Also, a much larger displacement is reached in step 13. The unloading response in step 14 is now quite realistic, with a permanent positive displacement at zero load. Finally, we show the plastic zones for this analysis. Note that we show the initial mesh, time zero, and then immediately the time equals six results. Initially, the plasticity progresses much as in the analysis without equilibrium iterations, but the final spread of plasticity reached in step 13 is larger, and after unloading of the load, at the end of the analysis, the complete plate is elastic. However, clearly permanent deformations have occurred, as can be seen by looking at the deformed mesh at time 14. As we discussed already, our analysis results now look quite good, they look quite reasonable, uh, but one additional way to evaluate the analysis results is to plot stress vectors. We did so in the linear analysis of the previous lecture when we also looked at the analysis results obtained from this mesh, but of course in linear analysis. We want to do now the same for the nonlinear analysis results that we obtained, and let us qu just quickly look at what we are doing in the stress vector output. Uh, we plot at each integration point two lines sh as shown here. If they are carrying an arrow, then it is a tensile stress. No arrow means compressive stress. And notice these two lines correspond to the principal stresses. Uh, notice that the lengths of these lines give us uh, are proportional to the magnitudes of the stresses. So let us now do a stress vector plot for the mesh at time 13 and at time 14, in other words at maximum load application and after removal of the total load for the results that we just have obtained. Here we see the stress vectors plotted onto the total mesh for the stress state at time 13 that is, at total load. We note, of course, that there is very much information. There are many stress vectors. To see any detail, we have to focus our attention onto certain elements. Here we now look closer at the elements adjacent to the horizontal symmetry line. We note that the stress vectors correspond to vertical tensile stresses as expected. At the top edge of the plate, we see tensile vertical stresses and tensile horizontal stresses. The maximum stress at any integration point is 1100 megapascal and occurs near the hole. Here we now see the stress vector plots at time 14, that is, after load removal. It is most interesting to study the stress flow in the mesh. Note that the stresses flow along and parallel to the free surface of the plate. This must be so because there are no externally applied tractions anymore. Here we see the detail of the stress flow in the corner of the plate. The stress vectors are parallel to the free surface. And here is the stress flow in the elements around the hole. The same observations apply. The maximum stress is 880.3 megapascal. This completes what I wanted to show you in this phase of the analysis. This completes our materially nonlinear only analysis of the plate. However, if we look at the solution results once more closely, we find that in this element here, the magnitude of the strains is about 2% at the end of load step 11, 4% at the end of load step 12, and 14 to 15% at the end of load step 13. In other words, at maximum load application, we have certainly here large strains. And one might very well ask, what is the effect of this large strain on the analysis results? Of course, in the materially nonlinear only solution, we did not include any kinematic nonlinearities. So our next objective is then to perform analysis that include 
kinematic nonlinearities. And we want to now proceed with a total Lagrangian formulation analysis, which includes large displacements, large rotations, but only small strains. Uh, and I also want to share with you some solution results that we obtained using an updated Lagrangian formulation. We did not talk about this formulation in the earlier lectures. We did talk about this formulation, but not about that formulation. Uh, this formulation really is best covered in a separate lecture. Uh, however, never, it's still very interesting to look at the solution results that we obtain with this formulation. If you want to read up on this formulation, please refer to the study guide in which the a reference is given, uh, a paper is referred to in which this formulation is described. So let us now look at the solution results obtained from these three formulations. Uh, and the solution results that we want to look at are, once again, the force displacement curve for each of these formulations. Now, in other words, force applied here, displacement seen here, uh, for these three formulations. Let's turn back to the laboratory and see what are the results. Here we see the analysis results for the MNO, that is the materially nonlinear only, the TL, that is the total Lagrangian, and the UL, that is the updated Lagrangian formulations. We look first at the horizontal axis scale, giving the displacement. and then at the vertical axis scale, giving the load, that is the pressure applied. Notice that there are three, in fact we will see later, four distinct curves. However, until there is much plasticity, the curves are almost the same. The TL analysis results correspond to the smallest displacements. The MNO solution gives larger displacements, and the UL solution gives the largest displacements. For the UL solution, we actually see two curves when looking closely. These correspond to using one's 14 steps, as for the TL and MNO analyses, and then using once twice the number of load steps. Note that the unloading response in all solutions is quite the same. However, of course, the permanent displacements at zero applied load are quite different because the maximum displacements corresponding to peak load were different. These analysis results underline the importance of choosing the appropriate kinematic formulation for the analysis. Here, large strain effects are quite significant at the very high load levels. In the next analysis, we now consider the effect of a shaft in the hole. Notice we look at the same plate as before, except that we now first consider elastic conditions only. And the shaft is shown here. The shaft has this Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, same as the plate, uh, but it is five times thicker than the plate, and for the shaft we also consider plane strain conditions. What we want to do is place a shaft in there, the shaft being initially flush with the hole, assuming no friction between the shaft and the hole, and then we pull on the plate and want to investigate what is the effect of having that shaft there? The analysis input data have to now be modified because we have to put the shaft in there uh, using finite elements, as shown here in red. We use collapsed eight node elements to represent the shaft. In other words, these collapsed eight node isoparametric elements become, of course, triangular elements, as shown here. Notice we now have a contact surface here. And that contact surface is modeled using a contact algorithm, which we did not talk about in this series of lectures. Uh, this, again, would be best covered in another lecture. I like to refer you here to uh, another paper, the reference of which is also given in the study guide, if you're interested in reading about the contact algorithm. The contact algorithm can take into account frictional conditions as well, but in this particular analysis, we assume zero friction along the contact surface. The solution procedure that we are using is the full Newton method without line searches, and the convergence criteria that we're using are listed here. These we have been talking about earlier already. Uh, here we now, because of the contact conditions, have to introduce also this convergence criterion, 
which is really a convergence criterion on the incremental contact force. So let us now proceed with this analysis. And uh, once again, we perform the analysis. And of course, we're looking at the solution results. Here we see the mesh of the plate once more, the mesh we used in the previous analyses. We now need to change the input data for the analysis to also define the shaft. This is done using Adina in. We need to define the additional nodal points and elements for the shaft in the same way as we input earlier the nodal points and elements of the plate. Let's look at the information that defines the contact condition between the plate and the shaft. And here we see the input for Adina in. There are two contact surfaces. The one is the plate hole surface and the other is the shaft surface. We denote these two to be a contact surface pair. Here you now see the mesh of the shaft and the plate. The shaft is defined by triangular elements. Here we see the deformed mesh at maximum load. Note that the plate has been extended vertically and has shrunk horizontally. The shaft has prevented the hole to shrink much horizontally. And on top of the shaft, a gap has opened. All these deformations are quite realistic. Here we see just the shaft and the ring of elements of the plate around it. Once again, the calculated deformations make sense. If we look closely at the shaft by itself, we observe that it has been compressed horizontally by the plate. Let's look next at some stress vector plots. These also show that a physically realistic solution has been obtained. Here we see the stress vectors in the element layer of the plate around the shaft. Note that the stress vectors are plotted onto the original mesh. For the element adjacent to the horizontal symmetry axis of the plate, we see a vertical tensile stress and a horizontal compressive stress. Such stresses are to be expected. The horizontal compressive stress is of course due to the contact with the shaft. Note that going around the shaft, the stress is in the plate aligned to be parallel to the free surface of the hole, since there is only contact near the horizontal symmetry axis of the plate. This completes what I wanted to discuss with you for this phase of the analysis. Finally, I would like to look with you at the analysis results we obtain when we apply to this plate with the shaft, 100 MPa up there and down here. We assume that the plate is made of an elastoplastic material. In fact, we model that material as shown earlier in our early analysis. And in addition to this loading here shown, also the shaft expands. It expands uniformly. And uh, in fact, it expands 0.05% based on the initial dimensions of the shaft during each load step. And we apply 10 load steps. So the loading then altogether is in the first load step, 100 MPa applied here. And in the, from the second to 11th load step, we expand this shaft by 0.05% in diameter, so to say, based on the initial dimensions. We use the updated Lagrangian formulation to model the response of the plate. Let's look now at these analysis results. Here we see, just as a reminder, once more the mesh we are using. Also, here is once more the detail of the mesh around the shaft. This is the deformed mesh at step one. The deformations are due to the tensile load of the 100 megapascal on the plate. Next, we plot the plastic zones in the plate as they develop, when the shaft expands. Notice again the time code above the mesh giving the step number since delta t equals 1. There are altogether 11 steps. The shaft expands from step 2 to step 11. We see the time code running, and at time 7, we see the first plasticity. This plasticity spreads as the shaft further expands. The maximum plastic zone is, of course, reached at the maximum expansion of the shaft, that is, at time 11. This completes what I wanted to say about this analysis. Note that after each analysis step, we looked at the calculated deformations and stresses to identify whether these make sense. This then brings us to the end of this lecture and to the end of this course. I'd like to now just take a few minutes for some closing remarks regarding the course. I mentioned already in the first lecture that nonlinear finite element analysis 
is a very large field. There are continuum mechanics principles, numerical algorithms, and software considerations. We could not cover in detail many aspects of all of these fields in these 22 lectures. However, I do believe that the 22 lectures provide a good introduction and a good foundation for further study. I would hope that you would listen to these lectures with your colleagues, that these lectures would initiate discussions, stimulations for your work in nonlinear analysis, and of course also questions. We at MIT continue to work in nonlinear finite element analysis, and we also offer from time to time weekly courses. I would be glad to see some of you at these weekly courses to share some of the experiences that you have had listening to the lectures, to these video lectures, and also regarding your work in practice. Finally, I'd like to mention that a course of this nature, a video course of this nature, can only be produced through the concerted effort of a number of very devoted people. I'd like to thank for their collaboration and support Dick Noyes, Elizabeth De Rienzo, Pat Wagand of the Center of Advanced Engineering Study at MIT, and Ted Sussman, my student. And very finally, thanks also for the crew around here. Thank you for your attention.